Welcome to the Mike Gum Watch Podcast. I am your host, Mike Veerman, and I am here with my friend and trusty producer, Max Kerman. Max, what's going on? It's, it's going pretty good. Uh, somebody, I forget who asked me, uh, what exactly do you do as a producer, Max? <laughs> I think we, are, we had a meeting at, at 299 Queen Street West, and I was like, I've been asking myself the same question. <laughs> you do a great job. You prep the questions, you come here, you share your time. Yeah, okay. I don't know that's a producer rule, but I'll take it. <laughs> Just take the title and run. Okay, yeah. Max, today's episode has a bit of an L.A. theme. Uh, Our friend Shane, who's going to be on later in the episode, he just got back from L.A. and he's got some crazy stories about uh, going out there this weekend. Mm -hmm. Our featured guest today is the president of Pop TV, Brad Schwartz. And this is one of the interviews that we did on a trip to L.A. sort of in the early days. We will get into that. But first, Maxie, what have you been up to, man? Uh, You know, it's uh, it's getting to be the Christmas season. It's true. And uh, I want to know, have you done any Christmas shopping yet? Have you? I leave it till like the last minute. Actually, I have a story about Christmas shopping at the last minute. So maybe I'm like a bit of like a, a downer when it comes to Christmas in the sense that I find Christmas shopping so stressful. Getting uh, gifts for people, done. having to put that kind of thought into it. Because here's the thing. I don't want anything. No. I would never expect a present from anyone. But I know that, you know, sometimes you got to go out your way and do the damn thing. Yeah. So anyway, I end up leaving it until the last minute. Yeah. So uh, quite some time ago, like maybe the early 2000s, mid 2000s, I had done just that. I left my Christmas shopping until Christmas Eve, and I was at the Eaton Center okay. here in downtown Toronto. And so I'm walking around. I'm scrambling, getting stuff for my brother, for my grandmother, for my dad, all these people. And I see a guy walking towards me, and I kind of recognize him. And I'm like, who is that guy? And he kind of looks at me a couple times to kind of see if I'm looking at him. And I'm like, how do I know this dude? I'm like, did I go to high school with this guy? And he's getting closer, and he's getting closer. And as he sort of like gets about two feet in front of me, it clicks and I go, oh shit, that's the guy from The Notebook. It's Ryan Gosling. Oh my God, okay. Yeah, it's Ryan Gosling, but it was like before he was super, super before famous. He, was Ryan Gosling. he wasn't super, he was just the guy from The Notebook okay. at that point. And I kind of immediately thought to myself, you know what? I kind of felt bad that I was out here shopping on Christmas Eve, leaving it to the last minute. But f- it, the guy from The Notebook leaves it to the last minute too, so I can't be all that bad. <laughs> That's really cool that you remember a time in Ryan Gosling's career when he was like, is this person going to recognize yes. me? Yes. And now he probably just assumes everybody recognizes. Sure. And maybe I'm, you know, inflating the experience in my head. But I really, because he was, the reason I noticed him is because he was kind of looking at me. And I was like, do we know each other? But I think he was just like, oh, is this dude going to recognize me from the movie? And I remember thinking, man, there's probably like a bunch of 16-year-old girls that love The Notebook that would like be losing their minds right now if they knew that this guy was here shopping on Christmas Eve. Um yeah, it's about, what else have we going on? We uh, we played in Buffalo this weekend. You did. Yeah. Uh, my girlfriend Danica and I almost came down. Yeah, you know, it's Buffalo is a great town, and the band does pretty good there. Uh, but kind of a cool thing happened before the show. I got a text from a mutual friend, this guy named Alan Boyton, uh, who's sort of a man about town, and he knows a bunch of hockey players in the NHL. He says Tyler Innes and Ryan O'Reilly, two stars for the Buffalo Sabers, they want to come to the show. Hey, can you hook them up with tickets? Uh, so I was like, all right, cool. So they came to the show and I gave Tyler Innes my phone number. And it was actually kind of cool because Lauren, my girlfriend Lauren, her dad has season tickets to the Sabres. And so she knows Tyler Innes, Ryan O'Reilly. Like, you know, she knows who they are. She knows who they are. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I brought him back backstage after the show. And the cool thing about it, and I sometimes forget this, is that these are like young Canadian guys in their early 20s. It's sort of our demo. So like to, uh, to them, it's like we're kind of like, they're a big rock and roll band. Yeah. Uh, but it's like, you guys are multi-millionaires <laughs> <laughs> and you're 22. <laughs> so it's just kind of a funny dynamic. But we were talking about music. Ryan says, you know, he plays a little guitar. He likes to try to write some songs and stuff. So I was trying ah. to give him some tips. It was, it was, it was, the whole thing was very cool. Very nice, guys. Maybe we'll get him on the pod, too. Ooh, yeah. there's a little tease. Yeah. Speaking of the pod, Max, mm-hmm. today we're going to have one of our first interviews ever. Very interesting guy. Uh, very accomplished guy. This is the president of Pop TV, Brad Schwartz. Yes. And, you know, uh, we're really excited about this because I think a lot of the podcasts that we like to listen to often involve, you know, people in entertainment, but sort of talking about the minutia, to use one of your words, uh, of what it means to, you know, to work in music or television. And so even though Brad, you know, isn't like a, an actor on screen or a musician, he has been part of orchestrating like everything from his early days on, uh, when he was an intern on SNL to Much Music to taking over Pop TV and rebranding because he used to be TV guy. Yeah. Now it's called t- uh, Pop Television. And so he's one of these guys and 
that just has so many stories about, uh, you know, his life in entertainment. And so I was like, we need to talk to him because, you know, from when I, I've met him a couple of times and he's always been an amazing storyteller. And like, honestly, for our listeners, like how the hell do you even become a president of a network anyway? Yeah. That seems like such a unattainable title, right? So it's like, if we're able to sit down um, with somebody in that position and ask like, how do you get here? You know? And then once you get here, what does it look like? Like, what does your day look like? Yeah, it's all like really valuable stuff. Because as we know, it's like if you want to make a life in the arts, it's like there's a business part of it. There's sort of uh, the working in a team part of it. Uh, and he, you know, he's right in the thick of it. You know, and since uh, we did this interview, obviously we've done this podcast uh, with much. We've interviewed everybody, you know, from Scott Weiland to Will Butler to Chris Hadfield, Frank Joshua Turner Jackson. On exactly, on. all of these sort of amazing people we've had an opportunity to interview. But when we were kind of conceiving of this and we just needed people to talk to brad was one of the people that was kind enough to sort of say yeah come by the offices and we'll talk you know and those are the kind of people you really rely on um especially when you're trying to do anything new you're like you know who are the people we can reach out to that we feel a kinship with that you know have exuded like warmth and openness in the past you know the same thing i could say for menno and annie absolutely Uh, lights and, and lights you know you know and and I think especially in the early stages of anything, in the early stages of podcasting, like you're really counting on, on your friends or people that you've, you've known for a while to throw a line to you. So here it is, Brad Schwartz in L.A. You're the president of a network. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, the title of president naturally carries a lot of weight. But like I said, it's also mysterious. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, what's your typical day look like? Is there a typical day? Um, yeah, you know, it's a, there, there's so many amazing things that go into a television network every day and it's all got to be com- it's all got to be connected <clears throat> and too often you know you've got your affiliate distribution team that's working on one thing and you've got your ad sales team they're not doing another thing and you've got your marketing team doing one thing and and uh, uh, your creative team doing thing and everyone's working so hard and everyone's working on their projects um, but ultimately outside of these like you know kind of senior team meetings that seem to happen um, how does it all kind of get connected, and how are you inspiring more of those connections, and how are all those connections leading to you know your ultimate kind of business goals? So my you know day to day, and it's funny the the higher up the ladder you get, the farther away from the creative process you get, and I think we all got into this business to be part of that creative process, you know, right. and as you become vice president and a senior vice president and a president you know you it, it, unfortunately you get farther away from the actual making shit why you, know? you got into it why you got into yeah. it right? that's what we all want to do right sure. imagine you're you're in a band you love being in a band you love writing songs or whatever but eventually become so successful that now other people are writing the songs and other people are playing the instruments you know and you're you know running the record label and what's you're the not, you know, what would the trade-off be then to sort of get further away from the creative process is it that you know, sort of, is, is, it, is it the climbing the ladder? Is it the control? Is it getting to sort of shape the vision? Is that, do you get the joy out of that? Uh, well, I, well for, I, 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 I'm not trying to diminish that there are joys at, the, uh, <laughs> at, 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 at both ends. But, um, but I think that's why I've enjoyed so much building networks as opposed to just, you know, someone hiring you to run some conglomerate. That's established you know, already. That's established already that, you know, we launched MTV in Canada. Yeah, and we built that completely from scratch when, you know, we had the chance to uh, to take over uh, uh, much music, and I mean, you were there. It was, uh, it was kind of had 30, 35 percent ratings declines. It was you know in trouble. It yep. hadn't kind of reinvented itself, and uh, people weren't watching music videos on TV, and it was in a you know a little bit of a problem spot. And uh, we rebranded it. You know, we, we did some exciting things, and we uh, we started we, we, we changed the way we treated music, but we still wanted music at our core. But we uh, you know we branched out to things like Pretty Little Liars and Degrassi and all that kind of stuff, and delivered you know the highest rated uh, year in much history. Um, so I think when you're building things like that or rebranding things like that, then there's no clock that you're working on. And therefore, you are involved in the creative, and you're involved in the brand because you're involved in inventing it all or reinventing it all, um, as opposed to just kind of sitting on some perch as a president, you know, of a monster company where your only interactions are with your senior vice presidents. Right. Um, I haven't been in that. 
position in my career. I've uh, been fortunate to kind of build lots of things. And, uh, and when you're building, you're involved in everything. So it's fun. Would you say that when you get to that point where it starts to feel established that you tend to get antsy and start seeking out new challenges? You know, my resume would say that, <laughs> you know, it does seem to, uh, uh, my wife keeps telling me, she's like, when are you just going to enjoy one of these? You know, when we, uh, when I, when I made the decision to, to leave much music at MTV, well, first of all, I cried. <laughs> you know, it was a very emotional, <laughs> couldn't believe I was making that decision. Uh, how, I, how hard did you, did you? take to come to that decision was it something that had been going on a long yeah time? that was that was a long that was a long that was that was a tough one you know um i think as a canadian kid growing up and loving music music was everything to me um you know you you grew up with much music and uh you know your, your parents would put you to bed at night and then as soon as you heard they were asleep you'd go turn your tv back on and watch more <laughs> much music right yeah and i was the kid that you know wrote down the much music 30 music videos so I could go to school the next day and be like do you see who's number one do you see who's number seven do you see who's who's jumping up who's falling down argue about the order and argue about yeah. the order you know sit there and wait you know um, you have to you have to sit through the Ghostbuster song in order to get to <laughs> When Doves Cry by Prince, you know, but you had to watch one video to get to the next video. Um, so to, uh, you know, to flash forward in your life and to one day be running Much Music after being that kid that grew up watching Much Music. I remember walking down Queen Street as a kid and crossing the street to walk on the other side of the street from Much Music because I didn't think I was cool enough to walk by the Much Music studio. To stay on the south side. To be on the street front side of that. Yeah. And, you know, all the, all the kids outside or people watching. I didn't think I was cool enough. You know, that, oh my God, it's Much Music. So then you flat, you know, and then like 20 years later, you're running it. And it was uh, surreal. And, uh, and I respected that opportunity every day that I had it. So to leave that, you're like, am I insane? There are like four people, maybe five people in history that have run much music. You're one of them, and you're just going to kind of give it all up and uh, go start a new challenge. And that was a very, very difficult decision. And I think it even, I think it was more difficult in the in kind of the three or four months that followed, where um, you know I'm not going to use the word uh, uh, I'm not going to use the word depression because that is a you know a very, very real and very, very important and very, very uh, you know yeah. You know, significant issue in people's lives so I don't use it lightly but I, there was certainly a tremendous uh, buyer's remorse I think right. for those first four months I was missing much music and MTV every single day were you questioning your decision constantly for like four months yeah like, like buyer's remorse like buying, yeah yeah you know, a house and being like oh, what did I do um, and and really what it was was you know missing the people yeah you, you get to work in music and you get to do that every day, but you also got to work with Justin Stockman, and you mm -hmm. got to work with you know Tracy Martin, you got to work with Greg Stewart, you got to work with Randall Graham. I could go on and on and on, and just these guys that were like, this is the best media team ever from top to bottom, that uh, you literally just could have picked them up and put them in the offices in New York and said, okay, now you're Fuse. Obviously, like I said, president is a big title, and nobody wakes up a president. Mm -hmm. uh, Walk us through your path to getting here. Where did you start? How did you get into this business? How did you get into television? Yeah, so I am, I am that story of starting as an assistant. <laughs> and, uh, I, my first job in entertainment was uh, the assistant to Lorne Michaels on Saturday Night Live. That's so, phenomenal. So I, I literally started as at the lowest salary level possible. Uh, and Lorne, by the way, had three assistants. I'm not speaking at I'm not speaking out of school there because that's right in the Saturday Night Live book that he had three assistants. What's the path to an assistant though? For people uh, who are like I'll, how I'll, I'll get you I'll oh, get to okay, that in a second. If you, if, I, if you want to know that, I'll tell you that. Uh, I want to know it all. Uh, so and I was the third assistant, obviously. I was like the lowest totem pole. So I was the assistant that got you know matzo ball soup and coffee and popcorn and water. Like I was that assistant. Yeah. And uh, making so little money, I don't know how I ever afforded to live in New York City. Um, but that's where I got my MBA in television. That's where I learned television. And to this day, Lauren Michaels will always be, uh, you know, one of my uh, four or five mentors in life of why I'm where I am today. Because I learned television from him, being in a live environment where every single Monday you start with nothing, and every single Saturday night at 11:30 you have a show, 
and seeing that process every single week, you can't help but just learn how television is made and how television is made live. Uh, and that's a, a skill set that will help you everywhere. Uh, I was also very fortunate the year I worked for Lauren. We, uh, when I say we, you know, I was bringing the coffee. Um, but we, uh, it was the year Letterman left NBC for CBS, and uh, and NBC went to Lorne Michaels and said, "Here's 12:30 in the morning, do something with it," and we created uh, the Conan O'Brien show. Right, right. So I was there watching a show from scratch, from hiring the producers to you know the band to what's the vision going to be? Is the desk going to be on the left or the right? Who's going to be the, you know, I mean, I had to sign confidentiality agreements about, you know, because they were interviewing a bunch of people and they, they auditioned a bunch of people. They put a lot of people on tape. I wasn't allowed to talk about any of it. And the genius of Lorne Michaels, you know, he's the Yankees. He always he is the greatest comedic eye for talent in the history of the business. Obviously, you know, saw something in Conan O'Brien that yeah. nobody knew. That's a phenomenal education, too, to be able to. Yeah. They're the best. To They're watch, best. you know, comedy history up close unfold. Yeah, and just to, to sit in and, you know, do Lauren's call sheet, you know, where you had to call, you know, people back, you know, right. was like before email. Um, so you had a call sheet and to listen to Lauren on the phone with people and how he dealt with people and how he negotiated with people and how he sold people. All of that helped create you know, my career in this business. Is, is he as sort of intimidating and paternal as people describe him? You know, I've heard that not to me. Um, and how did you get to the assistant role? So I was, um, I was, uh, you know, I went to high school in Canada, but then I went to university in the states, and I went to uh, the Where, where'd you go? I in went the states? to uh, the University of Pennsylvania, okay. in Philadelphia. Uh, recently named the number one party school in the country by Playboy magazine. Is that accurate? Well, Playboy says so. <laughs> in your experience, was that accurate? Uh, we had fun, you yeah, know. Uh, but it was all what's great is that, you know this year it was also named the number one university in the country by U.S. News and World Report. So you think uh, you know church and state never align? Well, number one party, <laughs> number one party school, number one school as well. You so, can't have uh, it. All. U.S. News and World Report and Playboy agree on what. <laughs> The best university of the country is, but I was, uh, I was, uh, I was at school there, and I got a summer internship, like literally an unpaid summer internship, at Broadway Video, which oh, is yeah. Lauren, Hall, which is Lauren Lauren's out. production company, and I was a marketing major and a communications major at you know an Ivy League university, and I got this great internship, and the end of the summer came, and I was ready to go back to Penn for my junior year, my third year. Uh, for how we Canadians call year three. Um, and one of Lauren's like senior advisors came up to me and I think more out of um, flattery than realism said, oh, yeah, well, I guess one of Lauren's assistants had left and gone on to some other job and she was freaking out that like, we have two weeks of Saturday Night Live so I need to hire another assistant and you know, it's not always easy to hire an assistant, somebody right. that's gonna get along and, and have trust and all that. And she said, uh, she's like, oh, I wish you weren't going back to school. I'd hire you in a second. Wow. Seriously, probably wasn't serious about that statement, but just said it. But I walked down the hall of Broadway Video, and I found an empty office. And I went to the empty office, and I closed the door, and I dialed 416-323-00. Called my dad. He's like, Dad, um, what do you think about me taking a year off from school and working at Saturday Night Live? And, uh, and my dad, who hadn't, you know, went to business college, but didn't go to university, and always believes in street smarts, and uh, you know, there's many different ways of learning besides books. He said, uh, "He's like, you're like you're, you know, you're at an Ivy League school. You should probably, you got into an Ivy League school. It's probably important to graduate from Ivy League school. It's kind of a, a big opportunity. But uh, uh, as long as you go back to school, you know, go for it. Go learn. Go learn business. Go learn." And so I went back to her and I said, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. She, uh, well, she said, no, I can't take you out of school, blah, 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 blah. And I just said, no, no, no. I, uh, I, I'm going to consider this like, uh, you know, I was a communications and marketing major at school. This is exactly what I want to do with my career. It's almost like a one-year apprenticeship. And then I'll go back to school. Had you grown up loving uh, SNL and comedy? And like, was that something that you were massively interested in as a child? Or growing uh, up? You know, media for sure, music. Right. Always. But unlike you two, I could never do it. 
Uh, I was, I was always, I was the, I was the manager. You know, those that do do like you guys, and those that don't manage <laughs> or right. teach, right? So uh, that was always me. You know, after college, I managed bands. You know, I was in the music business for a long time. Did, did was your dad a big fan of entertainment? Like, did he understand the need for no, you to go? Or was no, he, like... well, he knew my. You know, I was, uh, I acted in college. Oh wow! I uh, DJ. I'm sorry, I acted in high school and college. In high school. Uh, when we had a hockey game, I was the guy that brought my huge clip speakers that you literally had one at a time to the hockey rink, my my little stereo, and I would DJ at hockey games, you know, between periods and, <laughs> and you know the warm ups and all that. So I was that guy in, in high school. Um, so and a performer and a debater and a public speaker. Like I just I always loved that. So uh, you naturally you know kind of want to be. Uh, in the entertainment business, and I ended up behind the camera instead of in front of the camera. In, uh, in your time at uh, SNL as an assistant, did you mm -hmm. forge a lot of relationships that sort of carry on to this day? I mean, were you? There's so much talent at that time. That was like the the, the Mike Myers, yeah, Adam Sandler years. I probably should have been smarter. It was. I mean, it was. The, so the year I was there, it was uh, it was their highest rated year uh, to that point, and they were named uh, Entertainment Weekly's Entertainers of the Year that year. Wow. It was an election year. Um, and uh, the musical guests that year were Neil Young and Madonna and Mick Jagger and uh, Paul Simon, Paul McCartney. I mean, the year I was there, it was just like, is that the famous like are you kidding? <laughs> are you the kidding? One, there's a story in Life from New York where McCartney sort of plays Hey Jude and yeah. everybody stands around and it's kind of this, everybody describes in the book as this massive moment where it's like we're all sitting here watching Paul McCartney play Hey Jude. So I did not know that was in the book, but let me tell you my story. Yeah. So <laughs> I love this book. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. I did not know that was in the book because the story I'm about to tell you, I've told a million times. We're uh, uh, so he's camera blocking in the studio, and you know everybody only does two songs on Saturday Night Live. But Paul was going to do three. He's going to do one at the end of the show. And uh, none of us really knew that or maybe paid attention to the rundown or whatever. And everyone's building sets and, and doing wardrobe and there's people practicing lines over here, people doing lighting. It's like, you know, in the, in the week, you know, it's pro when do we do uh, camera blocking for music? Probably on Thursday. Um, anyway, so he does his first song, he does his second song, and I think they were both new songs. And then uh, and he's sitting there and they're like, all right, let's set up for song three. And he goes and he sits down at the piano, starts playing Hey Jude. And it was literally like people building sets and going, it was like, <laughs> and then heads turned. And all of a sudden, everyone's just you're sitting there. There's like 30 people in, in this studio, and Paul McCartney's sitting at a piano playing Hey Jude. And then all of a sudden, yeah, you kind of put your hammer down, and you kind of just walked over, <laughs> and there were like 20 of us just sitting on the stage. He was as close as you are to me, uh, sitting by the piano playing a Jew. I can't believe you were there for that. I, was, I had no idea that was in the book. Uh, I have the book. I, I, I have not read it. I really should. <laughs> that's unbelievable. Uh, but that, that certainly happened. Has anyone ever stood out as like, wow, this is undeniable talent. I am blown away. Like, maybe the best. The one that you sort of was undeniable to you. Can you narrow it down to one? Oh jeez, that I mean that is a that's a that is a crazy question. I certainly felt that way when I mean you know uh, Lady Gaga's first television performance in her entire career was on Much Music, and I remember uh, when we booked her on Much Music, it was actually at the time a favor to Universal. Uh, when, when they call for a favor, they do youth favors all the time, right? So when they call for a favor, you, you say yes. That's what relationships are. And uh, and they say, we have this girl. We really believe in her. We think she's going to be big. Um, can you know? Can we put her on much music? And we said yes. And she came and she played to track. And she wore an outfit that she made herself. And she had two backup dancers. And, uh, and that was as obvious as a... Smash as I think I've ever come across, where you just hadn't never even heard of this person, and she put, performs in front of you and uh, and just completely, completely blows you away, and you could just tell she was going to be you know that big, that big. So, but there's so many, there's so many examples uh, of, of that for me. It's hard to, it's hard to think. You know, I went to college with John Legend. You know, back then it was I mean back then he was John Stevens. 
and uh, and <clears throat> we were friends. And I remember him, you know, doing the clubs and playing in front of ten people. And I'd always go to those shows, and and try and support him. And he just knew his drive and his energy and his voice and his you know just sensibility and point of view that he was gonna he was gonna break through. And uh, and he eventually he eventually I mean you know he started he was doing session piano playing for Lauren Hill and eventually through that connection became a backup you know performer for Kanye doing keys and then Kanye you know f discovered him and, and signed him to his label and the, the rest you know, gave him the name Legend and uh, when you know, the rest is history he's probably one of the ten biggest superstars on the planet now um, and I was kind of uh, you know I always kind of knew that great things were going to happen to him and uh, and he's the kind of guy that for every great oh, all of his amazing success in music he has been equally successful in just being a great great person and um, a great philanthropist and a great you know cheerleader for really cool causes so uh, I love I love seeing and, and to this day if I text him or email him which I'll do two or three times a year gets back to me in five seconds and those are always the best people after your year at SNL where did yeah. you go from there did you did you go back to school uh, yeah so I, uh, I went back to school and um, finished up my last two years did you get intelligent right out of so school? I took all of that experience and all that creative energy and graduating from Penn and taking marketing at Wharton and seeing all my Wharton friends go off to six-figure, you know, consulting and investment banking jobs. I took all of my acting desire, all of my Saturday Night Live experience, and became a commodities trader. <laughs> <laughs> Just felt like that's what you were supposed to do when you graduate from Penn, right? You got to go make money, you got to go build a career, and, um, but, uh, you know, quickly realized it wasn't for me. I was, I was, so living in Philadelphia, I was uh, commodities trading, and uh, you, you did well, you, you kind of did well financially, so I had you know, some money in the bank, and I met a band called Cory, C-O-R-Y, a Philadelphia band, because I would always go out to the clubs and see bands like I always did. Even growing up, like I saw Black Flag at the Alma Combo, like, you know, I saw everybody. So I was still doing that, and I discovered this band called Cory, became friends with the band. You know, too many times in my life, I had had those moments where I had discovered some band and I'm like, oh my god, these guys are amazing, and started telling everybody about it. And then they become, like I saw the Bare Naked Ladies at Clinton's, <laughs> before anybody knew who they were. And I was like, these guys are amazing, ah, huge, before the, and, uh, and they did. Um, I went to a fraternity party my freshman year of college at the University of Virginia, and the band playing in the living room of this fraternity party was the Dave Matthews Band. And I was like, oh my god, these guys are amazing. And I went up and I bought their like self-made CD <laughs> off the stage, and I bought 10 of them. So I could bring them back to Penn and hand them out to all my friends, be like, you gotta hear this, you gotta hear this, you gotta hear this, you gotta hear this. Um, and so here was this opportunity where I felt the same way about this band, Corey. But unlike those stories that I can tell you about the Bare Naked Ladies and the Dave Matthews Band, this was an opportunity to kind of put your money where your mouth is. And, uh, and I said, I was like, look, I have some money in the bank, do you wanna go? Let's go make a record. Let's go make some demos. Let's wow. go, you know. You offered to finance a record for them and just jump right in. Whole thing. Like, let me help you. I was like, I'm good at marketing. I know how to sell. I know how to, I love music. I don't know how to do anything that you're doing, but I'm the sixth member of the band. I'm the president of your company. Your band is the company. I'm the president of your company. My job is to make you money, is to uh, sell your CDs to design your create you know to help design your creative like get put it all together and make all the phone calls and make all the pitches and do all that stuff and uh, and yeah they trusted me and I trusted them and we did it and I remember there were days where I was you know didn't have any money basically I was like had so little money in my bank and I, I had to decide all right I got eight dollars in the bank do I send out two more press kits or do I go get a piece of pizza? <laughs> I mean, those were decisions I was making in my head. What would you more often decide? The pizza? Send out two more press kits. <laughs> that's dedication. Right? Like, you, you have, it's the folder that's, you know, back then. You know, there's the folder. There's the card you put in. There's the CD you put in. There's the list of uh, gigs you're playing and your quote sheet from press. You put it all together and put it into a little FedEx thing. Send it off to the next label. Anyway, a crazy story is within six months, they were signed to Arista. You got them a deal? Yeah. Wow. And so that was, uh, 
that was awesome. Quit my commodities trading job and just kind of got into music full time and managed another band called The Red King and got them signed to Sony and worked with a songwriter named Mike Dutton who wrote on an EMI record and then man, worked with a band called The Ritual Licks that got a deal from Roadrunner. So none of these bands you've ever heard of, but literally there was a time in my life where I had like four record deals or publishing deals going at the same time. So you, you really your career, you were in the minutia of the music industry. That yeah. was your career. But there's nothing that I'm doing today that isn't the same as what I was doing then. Right. It's creative. It's making TV shows or making an album. Great people out there, go make an album. Great people out there, go make a television show. And then my job is to get people, as many people as possible to watch that show or listen to that music. Try and uh, you know do deals with agents and managers and get the right gigs and put people together. Uh, it's the same thing I'm doing today. Is it important for you as like someone that's sort of choosing like oh this is the band get the record deal or this is the television show I want to get a shot or promote? Uh, is it important that you personally love it? I think so because I, in order you know a big part of my job is just is selling. A big part of my job is convincing people to watch a show or convincing a producer to come work on a project or convincing you know people to do stuff and I think the only way you can do that authentically and really be and 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 be real with it is if you believe in it you know I don't know I, don't, I guess there are people out there that can fake it you know but I can't so I gotta love it if I'm gonna talk about it because and you know you have to talk about it like you talk about your kids or your family like you have to love it that much that you can just be so proud of it that you and that that, that salesmanship is just so infectious that you know subconsciously or whatever that you're not being sold you're uh, this person really believes it and I either like it or I don't but you know uh, I'm not being sold like I said I can't I don't necessarily make TV shows I could never write a song but you're the sixth guy in the band. You're the guy that's every bit as important, but you're taking their product, their vision, their love, that thing that just inspires me so much. I just have always loved creative people. I'm so inspired by them and their art. And, uh, and if I can turn around and help them create a career out of it and you know, go find the tallest mountaintop and the biggest megaphone and scream about it, that's really what my career has been. So that was in L.A. That was where we interviewed Brad. Um, and we're going to stick with the L.A. theme for this uh, this episode, Max, because now we have our pop culture aficionado, Shane Cunningham, on. Shane, what's going on? Yo, yo. You were just in L.A. I was. I just got back from the most exhausting trip of my life. You look a little tanned. You look good. That's a lie because I literally <laughs> saw zero sun. Oh, so that's, really? phon <laughs> that's phony Max coming out of his shell. His lead singer shell. Um, yeah, no, I, I had a gig in L.A., so it was a little out of my element. I don't really play video games, but I went to an eSports all-star game in oh. L.A., and I helped a friend uh, do a project out there, okay. which I thought was going to be a total fluff thing where I'm working maybe three hours a day and then partying, you know, <laughs> the, the rest, rest of, of 21 hours a day. <laughs> Wait, uh, let me explain esports. Esports, at first I thought it was like guys playing sports video games. That's what I would have assumed. It's, for lack of a better term, like total <laughs> nerds playing like <laughs> this game called League of Legends where they're like sorcerers and wizards. But these kids are the best in their field, and the video game industry is the most popular industry in the world. Like, what, it's what, sponsored by Riot Games. And just to put it in perspective, Riot Games made Grand Theft Auto. Uh -huh. Grand Theft Auto, on the first day of its release, made like $3 billion. So video gaming trumps everything in terms Even of Even oil? Even oil, yes. That's on like the uh, riots uh, billboard. Yeah, it says we trump oil. No, I don't know if even oil. May maybe like any entertainment. It okay, trumps. that okay. makes a little bit more sense. You know, when we talk about pop culture, we talk okay. about movies, music, Shane is saying that this gaming industry is far bigger it's than those. It's huge. These 18 year old kids, they bring home these $250,000 novelty size checks. Wow. They're, they're millionaires, right? Most of them are Korean. Okay. But if you happen to be a white guy who's really good at this, you're a rock star. Oh, you, really? you, you're an outlier. You stand out, and the chicks love you and stuff. It's, <laughs> it's such a nutty world. I can't. I'm so tired right now. I can't describe it properly. So you go down to this convention. It's not a convention. It's an all star game. 
Oh, the All Star. So like, there's like the LeBron James of League of Legends, and there's that's the Kobe literally Brown. how they refer. Are there to crowds him. at this sh- at this thing? Crowds, yeah. yes. Watching girls screaming. Well, there was one girl screaming, but <laughs> mo- it's, it, it's mostly guys uh, uh, screaming. Yeah, they were. There was literally, uh, if you followed me on Snapchat, which I know you don't, yet you follow my girlfriend for some reason, Max. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, right. some of the arenas. You know, Max is literally now <laughs> going to follow Shane. Are you or are you just going? Uh, oh, no, I'm going on Snapchat right yeah, now. Okay. Remember when you followed my previous girlfriend for two years before I got you to follow me on Instagram? Well, you weren't posting anything interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little side note. Um, but yeah, it, <laughs> I go to this all-star game and my job is to edit the interviews. So um, I had like, who was effectively my boss was this 23 year old guy and he was very into this. And then I went with my other friend, Mark, who he was just like me, like in his thirties, like could give a shit about the game, but was there to work. Uh-huh. He had the, I realized, which was the best job, which was cameraman. (laughs) Okay. The cameraman works about, (laughs) um, I would say, an hour a day. (laughs) And the editor works, literally, I'm not exaggerating, 21 hours a day. (laughs) I'm not exaggerating. Do you guys get paid the same amount? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So what did Mark do the rest of the time? He slept. He went to play basketball at Venice Beach. All that stuff that I thought I would be doing, Mark was doing. So (laughs) my producer, the 23-year-old, he's like, okay, now this is going to be a bit under your skill level, I'm assuming. So he's like, this is very easy gig. You get the interview, you edit the interview, you export the interview. It's fine. And in some cases, I need to subtitle the Korean kids. Oh, how'd you do that? (laughs) He transcribes it. Okay. And then sends me the transcript and I type it out. Okay. On paper... Not to quote a Max song, but this song is, (laughs) this job is very easy. But unfortunately, the thing that makes the titles for the subtitles was not working. And and 90% of the kids are Korean. So I had a shit ton of subtitling to do. Uh So instantly, the producer, the 23-year-old producer was all over my ass. And I started getting backlogged. And he's like, I needed this yesterday. He's (laughs) He's like, this needs to go to YouTube now. Faker's not going to get 100,000 views. This needs 100,000 views. So I started getting so backlogged. And then my producer, he's like, oh, well, we can't air any tonight. It's got to be tomorrow morning. So uh, yeah, you're going to have to do it in your room. kind of." So I went back to my hotel room and I edited all night. Go two full days without sleep. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. I did not sleep one wink. I swear to you. For a video game. For this video game thing. I'm like... You know, I'm panicking. I'm like considering suicide. Like, every, <laughs> I'm like, I'm a failure. I can't even do this seemingly simple job. The third day, it's Meyer's birthday night. Mark. So he says, Listen, Shane's not working tonight. He goes, He's coming out with me. This is getting ridiculous. He's worked like way too much. And I was like, F- Yeah, th- thank you. <laughs> and, he go, and then he goes, He'll do it when he gets back. <laughs> so, so I'm like, I got to go out, drink. And I can't say no. I was so tired. I was going to say I'm going to miss your birthday because I can't, like, you go party. We also had some friends out in L.A., but I'm going to stay home and get this done because so, it's stressing me out and I need to finish it. And then, But he's like, no, you're coming to party. So I go out. I meet actually Tim McAuliffe oh. from – Former podcast guest. Former podcast guest. Writer of Last Man on Earth. The Office, Jimmy Fallon. Yes, go on. And he's good friends with – Uh, Nathan Fielder, who I am obsessed with. So I had to go meet him. Nathan Fielder from Nathan For You. Yes. And my my friend's like, oh, I was with him yesterday, who was also with Tim McAuliffe. So there was a good chance I was going to meet Nathan Fielder this night. (laughs) So we end up going to like a pre-drink part in in LA. And then after the pre-drink, we go to the comedy store. And Louis C.K. is at the comedy store. What? Louis C.K. just like walked in and did a set. Apparently, these guys they, they do that. They quite work often the to work on the material. So, did you get to see some Louis material? No, we just missed them. Oh, okay. So I'm like, Fuck. but I see Chris Delilah there. Oh, yeah. He's he's kind of drinking off to the side. Who was in a documentary I was in. Yeah. So I was going to try to talk to him, but he was having some girl issues. It seemed like or something <laughs> was up with him. So I didn't talk to him. Ended up uh, meeting Tim's hot wife. Oh yeah. 
a pre- also previously mentioned on the podcast. Yeah, I think I talked about it. I was like, you're the hot wife. <laughs> oh, and we got to go to this, like, pr- they just inserted a private bar for, like, the celebrities that's through the um, kitchen. Okay. So I got to drink at, like, this. Ooh, that's cool. cool. Yeah, I was in a secret bar drinking, like, like Louis Wood or whatever. Oh, that's amazing. So that, that was very fun. Uh-huh. I get back at like 4 a.m. We go to 7-Eleven, eat taquitos and stuff because the Taco Bell was closed. And then I have to edit from 4 till 8 a.m. drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so then this is getting to uh, the last day. And the last day is where it all came together. Like, like everything clicked and I figured out all the bugs, how to subtitle and do everything properly. So my last day, I finally figured out how to do it. And we went out for this awesome... Korean barbecue dinner and I was starting to feel good. And then the producer that I won the 23 year old, he started respecting me. Oh, nice. And then as we were leaving, <laughs> this is the weirdest part. As we were leaving the Korean barbecue place, this hobo, he was kind of like a magical hobo. He rolled up on the, these old school bikes, Almost like hurt. what yeah. you'd imagine like Snoop Dogg would ride, like a, a beach cruiser, like you'd imagine Snoop Dogg would ride. And he just looked at me and goes, Hey, and handed me a joint. <laughs> Uh, and I puffed it and gave it back. And he goes, no. And gives it back for me for one more puff. I do it. And then I give it to him and he rides away. And the millennial kids were like, whoa. <laughs> they, just, they couldn't believe I did something that crazy. But it totally calmed me down. And I just felt good. It was like all worth it. It was like this whole experience. And then I'm like, oh, shit. I haven't watched any movies for the pod Oh, yeah. Because I'm going to come back and I'm not going to like, you know, I'm, I want to get back to talking about movies and shit. So, but then on the plane, I watched three movies on the way back. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. So, uh, I watched uh, a movie that Mike would effing love. Hit me. It's called Sleeping with Other People. Okay. Jason Sudeikis and Allison Brie. Yes. It's so different than you think it would be. It's a much more like realistic, funny. Seems like a, like a pretty generic rom-com. It's more than that. Like a sex comedy. Yes, it's very good. I suggest you see it. and You don't see Alison Brie's is boobies, it, but... Is it like a girlfriend <laughs> movie? Do you watch it with your girlfriend, or is that something that makes yes. you uncomfortable? Oh, my goodness. And the one girl in it looks so much like Mike's girlfriend. It's ridiculous. Oh, wow. I swear, watch it with your girlfriend. Yeah. You'll both love it. It's a total Mike movie. Then I saw a movie called We Are Your Friends. Oh, oh you Zac Efron. DJ movie. Way better than you think it would be. Oh, wow. It, it got like, you know... It was the worst opening for a box office in it the history. It did not of, make money. But critically acclaimed. You know what I heard? Really? Yes. I, I heard the problem was with the marketing. So it's like people in a DJ culture wouldn't see that movie. Nope. And people that don't like DJ culture would not see, see that movie. movie. So the movie was kind of made for nobody because people that are authentically into that scene are like, this movie is a ridiculous Hollywood it's, facade. It's very good. Uh, it, so you, what would you give the movie out of 10? Okay. So the plane landed before it ended. So I got 75% through. So I give it a 7.5 out of 10. It was on its way to a potential 10. Uh, No, I'm kidding. But no, 7.5. Way better than you would think. Okay. And what would you give e-gaming overall out of 10? Oh, e-gaming is hell. If you got to work there, I'm telling you, it f***ing sucks. It was the craziest thing I ever did. It was very rewarding to get through. To get the approval of a 23-year-old boy. Honestly, he knew everything. I don't care how old you are. If you're that knowledgeable about something and care that much, and he says you did good and you can impress him, it feels good. That was it. That's our episode. Another one in the books. Another one in the books. All the artwork for the Mike on Much podcast is done by Jenna Gregory at jennasdoodles.com. You can follow us at Mike on Much on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. Shoot us a follow. Yeah. Come on. Interact. And uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to the man that mixes all of these episodes, Matt Spears. You know, we come in with some shitty audio in these interviews that we do. Uh, sometimes we're a little too hot on these mics. He spruces it all up. And he just has to deal with it, you know, and he does a very, very admirable job. So, Matt Spears, thank you for uh, mixing this hunk of junk every week. <laughs> that was the other name for the podcast. Yeah, hunk of junk. Hunk yeah, of junk. exactly. Uh, the Mike and Much podcast is produced by Max Kerman, and I am your host, Mike Veerman. See you next week if we don't die on the weekend.